Hi, everyone. Thanks for um, joining us this evening. Uh, my name is uh, William Smith. I'm the editor of Art in America magazine. Um, and tonight I'm going to be uh, talking with uh, Kate Shepard, um, a painter I'm sure most of you know if you're here. Um, Kate's uh, most recent exhibition uh, at Le Long uh, opened on March 12th, which should have been an auspicious date, um, but pretty much the entire city went into lockdown on the next day. So I imagine um, very few of you um, had an opportunity to see this exhibition. Um, so I wanted to pull up some of the, um, well, I, I guess one of the nice things is that even though it, it closed um, relatively quickly after just a day, um, it was installed and uh, install shots were taken. So we do have a way to um, access the show from here. So let me just uh, share my screen um, and we can walk through that. Um, Kate, do you want to say a few words um, just to um, introduce yourself, um, get us started? Sure. Um, do you want me to talk about the show or just about me? Sure. Yeah, yeah, maybe um, as I'll just kind of click through and if um, something catches your eye, let people know what you were thinking. Um, I think it's really, I, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk about why I made these paintings. and. Um, I made them because I wanted to talk about the, the elephant in the room and the elephant in the room was what this kind of paint was doing throughout my whole career and people were talking about it, but I never really wanted to cop to it. And what that is, is that it was so reflective that you could barely see the line work, which was what I considered to be the painting. So since my last show at Le Long, which was six years ago, I decided that I needed to make some work that um, came out of the painting kind of making itself rather than my superimposing an image upon it. And um, it was hard to figure out, but this show is really a product of that search. And in the, um, in the midst of it, I had to let go of the line work which happened only, um, I would say a few months before the sh show opened, I just had to let go of it. And that was really exciting. You can't really see all the reflective qualities in this work, but basically there's this incredibly luscious velvety quality between the unsanded parts of the painting and the sanded parts of the painting. Um, always in between layers, I sand the painting down so that um, the paint will stick to the rough surface. And I've always loved that surface, but I never showed it because I didn't really have an excuse to show it. So this show really gave me the ability to show what was sort of like underneath the layers, but there's a, a beautiful kind of like comforting quality to the to the sanded surface. Kate, when we spoke earlier um, in preparation for this discussion, you mentioned that this work was Im uh, particularly important for you, um, maybe as a way of working through some of the ideas that you would realize in the exhibition. Could you tell us a little bit more about, um, about this one, when it was painted, when it was shown, what you were thinking when you were creating it? Sure. I think you know, I, I take snapshots of the paintings all the time and there's always some interruption or in this case, there's always a person. So the paintings are oftentimes on Instagram, selfies, people taking pictures of themselves in the painting. And as you can see, the line work is, is the quiet part of the painting, the part that you have to discover. So I think um, while this painting is really essential to me, um, all the paintings that I take snapshots of have all these interruptions. Um, so I sent this to you, Will, because I wanted to show you how this aspect of the, that's a siren. Um, anyway, that's sad. Um, I just wanted to show you that this is a, was an ongoing quality in the, in the paint that was part of the ingredients that I finally had to address. And, now this and this is, is not, like, yeah, 
Yeah, this go ahead. This is an image of one of the works that was in the show, but I think this does a, this photo does a much better job of demonstrating that reflective quality that you were talking about. Yeah, because when the paintings are in a domestic environment or in my studio, they really have a lot to reflect. And the beautiful part of um, sanding down most of the surface or part of the surface is that um, the shiny part becomes pictorial in and of itself, um, rather than the whole thing being obstructed. So that these trapezoids kind of act like surrogate paintings in, of surrogate paintings on the wall in a gallery or in somebody's house or in my studio, but they become part of a of a space space making device instead of um, being the painting itself. Here's here's another image, the one that I started the discussion with, um, which also demonstrates that the the painting here is really situated in space, and you can't look at it without also seeing the architectural space around it. Yeah, I'm really proud of this painting. It's kind of like a touchstone for me. Unfortunately, I didn't send you a picture of the painting itself, which is a visual conundrum in and of itself. But yeah, this is an example of what the paint does. Now, one of the ways that you've emphasized the reflective dynamic in the work um, is through the title of your exhibition at Lelong, um, which is Surveillance. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you came to that title um, and how you think these works relate to the idea of surveillance? Well, the, the first works I did in this show are the ones that are printed in the small room. And they're the, the most um, sort of uncharacteristic work of my career uh, so far. Um, they're the most obvious in that I would put a um, shiny blank panel on the wall and I would record what it saw and then put that back onto the panel by screen printing. So I found myself taking photographs or not taking photographs, but seeing that the painting was, seeing the ceiling with the lights off, these rows of fluorescent lights, which were inherently perspectival. So they checked off the box of how I consider a painting to be complete if it, ex if it expresses some level of, of space. Um, but they were spooky. There was, no, there, was, there was this kind of like scary absence in the painting. And I, I, I kept thinking that the person in the painting was really the guard in the watching this space from a video monitor, um, like this dead office space. So that was the watcher and um, the painting was watching the space and then this guard would be watching um, the video. So there was this element of, um, of watching and, and then the rest of the work started to take on that meaning as well for me. But um, I do keep a document of possible titles for paintings and possible ways of uniting the whole concept of a show. And that was the one that popped out for me because there was some innocence to the word in that it's about watching and being seen. But there was also something kind of almost not pernicious, but like sort of like spooky about it. Mm -hmm. Does yeah. that make sense? No, it definitely does. And um you know, as we're all on Zoom being surveilled in a certain way, I think the, the notion of surveillance as something that sort of brings us together in a certain way, but also has this edge of control to it is very important. One of the works in right. the show is titled Surveillance. Is that right? There is one painting and um, it's the one where you can see me um, is it this in one? half of it. Yeah, there's a there's another picture, I think, in the thumbnail where you can see me in half of it and me not in half of it. So the, the side on the right is my regular paint and the side on the side on the right is a beautiful sanded velvety surface and the side on the left is the regular paint. And so this is the last painting I did in the show. Something you, you said about this work when we spoke the other day, which is um, that this is 
this work demonstrates like the ingredients for the entire show. Um, that is kind of like an index or an instruction manual for viewers encountering the rest of the exhibition. Um, and that there was something very generous about um, letting people into the show in such a, a direct way. Right, yeah, exactly. It was the last painting I made in the show because I thought, why don't I give the viewer an opportunity to make their own painting so they understand the process of where this show came from. It was the most obvious thing to do, and yet it felt essential. And then obviously I had to think, oh, well, how many people have already done this painting? And I found that somebody else had done this painting, not with Shiny and Matt, but there was this real fight in me to, um, to know that there could be a reference point, but then to, let myself own it because it was relevant to this so-called argument. Why, why do you say that this is obvious? Um, just because of the 50-50 split on the canvas? Oh, because, well, it, it defies the, um, the requirements I have for making a successful painting. I'm just giving you the index. I'm yeah. just giving you like half of the ingredients of the omelet. Well, what are the requirements for a successful painting? How do you define that? Oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> yeah. No. Now we're getting um, into it. Here it, we go. I can do it really simply. It's a great question. Um, I always ask myself when I go to other people's shows, how do they know a painting is done? And what is it that they identify with in their own paintings? Um, Walter Robinson and I have been talking about how when we read paintings, there's an inherent code in, uh, in a painting. So I would say that the inherent code in my paintings, which is my own personal criteria is, does it make space? Does the viewer have a job to do? Am I giving the viewer an experience? Is there a sense of um, spookiness? emptiness, loneliness in the painting, but is there also like love and sweetness, which seems contradictory, but I notice that that's an ongoing thing in my paintings. Color, beauty, nostalgia, and then the titles. And I have to sort of, I have to, uh, when, before they're done, I, I feel like I have to answer all the questions that the painting asks, like, why is why are those two colors together? And then I'll have an answer and then I'll feel happy about it. But also like what I said earlier, I asked myself, what is the viewer gonna bring to this painting in terms of references, rather, whether it be art historical or present painting references? Because I feel like I have a sense of responsibility to, to either cop to those things or to lead them into a different direction, even if they have those references. What do you think the responsibility of the viewer is in front of a work like this? The responsibility or what am I asking them to do? Yeah, yes, that's a really exactly. good question. To figure something out. I think it's like, if I, if I could work on a painting and if it could be a puzzle for a long, long time, I, I kind of want to give them a little bit of an inkling of, the fact that it was a puzzle, um, whether it be reading a space here and there at the same time, or reading perspectival space in a way that either makes sense or really doesn't make sense. And also there's, even though color has a different reference over time, like I could see a Lego set or, or I could see an Olivetti, um, um, like logo in another generation will never see that reference. So that's another problem because while I hope that people see a certain emotional or cultural reference, I think cultural <laughs> references are fleeting. <laughs> so uh, I, I look for a sense of balance and imbalance at the same time, which I think most painters do. You said something really provocative um, earlier, which was that you think this painting had been made before, um, that it had been done before. And this is something we spoke about also. Um, um, 
you know, I, I would think that within a, a modernist tradition um, and monochromatic painting, geometric abstraction would fall into that. The idea really was to create something brand new. Um, so I'm intrigued by this notion that you are looking instead for uh, renewal, making something anew rather than something that is, is simply new. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your relationship to art history in that sense. Um, and perhaps it's a good time I can bring up the, um, the other set of reference images that we have. Um, but yeah, I'm curious about that, that idea of making something new versus renewal. That's a great question. I think it's really provocative. I have to admit, I will make a painting and then run to the computer to find a reference that it reminds me of. So I walked around Chelsea and found this Larry Zock show and it made me sad and it made me happy because it was basically the same kind of premise of having something hug a void. And I had to ask myself, what is the difference between what was going on in the 70s and what I am doing now? And I had to answer that question in the same way that I was mentioning earlier about grappling with the viewer's references. And this is and, one of the Larry Zox paintings that you're thinking about? Yeah. Okay. I don't know if this was in the show. Yeah, it's a shitty picture, so it must have been me on the iPhone. Yeah. And, and then you'll find this black and white image in, your, um, in one of the images that you have, which is actually one of my paintings, but rotated. So it's again, I just, one. yeah. The one on the right, basically if you turn your head, that's the saloon painting, except mine is a little like askew. So I thought, oh shit, am I effed or can I keep going? And this, so that was like a really interesting arresting point. I think I had it with like David Novros and I had it with a couple other painters. The painter with whom I did, and I, can, I would love to talk about how I got myself out of that Quagmire, which is that I realized that I wasn't just straddling the side of empty space, but I was bringing the viewer into it in a way that was um, less formal and more, not in this one, get away from this one. <laughs> um, that was um, sort of sure. more, yeah, like, like that red one, you know, like it was more, um, I'm, I'm bringing your hand into it in a more uh, personal way. I'll just leave it. I'll leave it at that. This is a, a so Barney Green print. Yeah, of course he came to mind. I ran to the computer. These days we have that capacity to um, to say, "Hey, who are my cousins? You know, who are the cousins that I may or may not want to play ball with?" Um, but I think I I think I got out of that. I mean, the only painting that I literally copied was the Matisse, the, the Porte Fenetre Ouvert. I thought, that, that's, that's my sibling, that's not just my cousin. Because while he blacks out after the fact, the street scene outside, the strips are pretty flat except for the stripes on the left side, the horizontal stripes and, and the um, diagonal line on the gray. So sometimes like in the old days, in my old days, I went to the Met when they let you and I brought an easel and the canvas had to be 10% bigger or smaller and I copied the Vermeers and I copied the uh, Van Dykes and um, my, the job I gave myself was to record the essential quality of the painting rather than the eyelashes and the teeth. And so this is the only painting that I essentially copied and had to debate whether or not I would put it in the show, but I thought it would be the so-called index painting of the show just to show you, you know, a deeper vocabulary of this exercise. But then I decided to make the index painting a really, really simple. And simple just to be clear, this is, the, this is your painting, right? Yeah. Okay. And then this is the Matisse, just so that everyone can see what had happened there. 
And to tell you the truth, I started this painting in 2008. So that's 12 years ago. I've been fascinated by this painting for 12 years, which is fun. It's fun to think that I have a history. I'm old enough to have history. <laughs> <laughs> you also um, wanted to mention this uh, Albers painting as being especially important. Well, it's not really a painting. It's more of a, a study for one of the homage to the square pieces. What is, what is it about this work that uh, attracts you? I have to say, a square painting for me is the hardest proportion to use, and I have rarely succeeded. But I did get a lot of them when I was printing with Luther Davis on the printed work, which I think you'll show later to the audience. Um, and then I didn't know what to do with them. And the obvious artist to turn to was Albers. He was the one who succeeded best with a square. So the earth painting in the show is, is kind of like wing set at Albers a bit. And then there was a painting that was straight up Albers and I called it Albers because I have working titles for all the paintings in the show, which is like the secret wink of where the reference might come from or might link to. Um, but it was too close, so I didn't put it in the show. You know, there has to be like a, like a, a kiss, but not a, not a full embrace. Interesting, interesting. Um, I wanted to, I, I think it's pretty clear uh, to everyone by now uh, through the discussion of your work that um, it's very much um, involved with staging a direct encounter with the viewer. Um, that your work takes into account physical architectural space, that you want viewers to be present in front of the work. Um, and yet at this moment, as we're conversing through Zoom, um, that's not possible at all. So, you know, my first inclination was, okay, we're, we're missing a fundamental part of what Kate does because we have to view these things on our screen that we're no longer to take, able to take in um, that really active experience that your work invites. On the other hand, um, there is something about the work that you've done that seems uh, to engage with digital culture to a certain extent, um, a virtual experience of artwork. Um, one of the works in the show is called Selfie, um, and you can very much imagine someone standing in front of it, um, taking a photo in the reflective surface um, and having a great selfie. Um, I mean, I'm looking at the work behind you right now. You can see the lamp and the reflection, and you can imagine how that would, would happen. Um, so in, this, in another sense, I guess you're anticipating how images of these works might um, be present on social media platforms or in some other kind of digital format. Um, so I wonder, given that we're limited now to a virtual presentation, does that change the way you think about your own work and this experience of real three-dimensional space? I, you know, I think that the paintings that are printed could be very, very easily, perhaps you could put those on the uh, ones that are screen printed, the ceilings. Uh, and okay. I think that these are the ones that I was referring to in regards to the, the poor man drinking coffee watching a dead space, which I actually think is so beautiful. Um, Could you describe things, the process here so that, that people know how you made these works and what you mean by printed? Sure, it's so fun. When people came to the studio, it would take three times to describe the process until they kind of got it. Um, so- We've got one shot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm gonna do this really clearly. You take a shiny painting, blank, you put it on the wall or you put it on the floor. It reflects the space. I take a picture of that reflection. I take that picture to Luther Davis and in Red Hook in a car service. <laughs> and he prints that onto the surface. And, you know, nine times out of 10, I would wipe it away and then this one I didn't. Um, so that's how it's made. But to answer your question, which is really good, I do not think the other paintings work 
virtually. I'm sorry to say, I think that they are so activated by walking past them or where are they? Are they here? Are they there? And um, I think these paintings work beautifully because they're not reliant to any kinetic experience, if that makes sense. They already have had their kinetic experience. They're post-kinetic. <laughs> I might be using that word kinetic wrong, which dates me as well. So are these works um, reflective when you see them in person or do they, so are you adding another layer to them that, it, you know, when you look at them in the gallery? It's a great question. Um, so you have your primary and then your secondary reflection. The one that's called Grove Bolts, that one takes on the room. These don't take on the room because there's so much half tone. If you have the Grove Bolts, that, that's an interesting diptych. It's like the blue pair with the fluorescent lights coming down. And it's on the thumbnails of the gallery. Since, since we're talking say. about the printed work, I can see that someone is asking whether these are, are new in your practice or... Um... Yeah, this is the most interesting part for me in the show that was like really hard. These paintings were made two years ago and they were such um, a radical jump from what I usually do that it made no sense to show them but I wanted to show them. So I had this beautiful talking to by Dan Walsh, one of my good friends whom I admire. And he said, Kate, you've got gold in your pocket, but you have to spend it wisely. You have to make a link between what would be experienced as your known work and this work. So it felt like, I told this great story with a punchline. I, well, I told a story or I told, a, I told a punchline and then I had to find the joke. This show was about making a link, which was, um, I think I really succeeded, but it was a really hard thing to do. In other words, to answer your question, these are the oldest works in the show, which is ironic because they're the most outside the box in the show. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I think that definitely makes sense. Um, Kate, I wanted to broaden things a little bit and just um, ask you about abstract painting in general. Um, and maybe that category is blurred a bit in the screen printed paintings because you, you do have kind of a, an image there. Um, but, but, you know, overall, I think, you know, we're seeing a, a kind of resurgence of, of figurative painting. Um, if you walk around Chelsea, that's a lot of what you're going to see. Um, so I, I wonder how you think about your commitment to abstraction um, and what it is that abstraction can express right now. I think there's a lot of figurative painting out right now because people are really excited about expressing their specific identity, which is great. We have a lot of catching up to do. And also specific stories. And um, I, I don't know, it's sort of like Donald Judd not wanting to be called a minimalist. I never ever thought about myself as an abstract painter. It's really hard to go to weddings. They say, oh, you're a painter. Do you do still lifes or landscapes? Um, so it's in between the two. I always think I'm a representational painter. But the truth is, is that I abstract the subject matter and that part of the criteria of making a painting is I want the viewer to recognize or recognize what he or she is looking at. And I also don't want to feed them a meal that's too easy. So I'm straddling between those two things, if that makes sense to you. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm interested in this relationship to the viewer that you're establishing. On, on the one hand, um, it's generous to the extent that you're inviting the viewer to take selfies, to be involved in the, the painting. Um, but on the other hand, you have uh, this 
this difficulty that you're presenting puzzles. Um, are these perceptual puzzles, conceptual? Um, how do you understand the nature of that difficulty? <laughs> well, for starters, I was in total denial about that paint for a while. So I, I didn't really understand the selfies. <laughs> it's, like, it's, like, it's like my being surprised that I'm tall. I showed something at Barbara Krakow right after 9-11, actually. It was a diptych made with oil paint and a child put his hands on the painting and the painting left an impression of his hands and I had to remake the painting and I decided I don't want to make delicate paintings. I don't want to make fussy paintings. I want to make paintings that have a resilience so that you can just live with the paintings and not have to be like precious with them. So I tell art handlers, you don't need gloves, just you can wipe these off afterwards uh, with a rag, with a what you know, with a soft T-shirt. So that's why I never really copped to the fact that they were really shiny. And I also think that <laughs> Peter Russo told me that just focus on Will's questions and don't change the subject. But here I am changing the subject <laughs> because I forgot the question. <laughs> I'm sorry. What was the question? The question was about. Um the nature of uh, difficulty. You, you talked about um, presenting a, a fairly difficult experience to viewers. Um, and, and so I was, we've talked a little bit about what makes your work sort of generous and open. So I wanted to hear what you think makes it difficult for um, the people encountering it. Um, gosh, I don't know. I, I, don't, I guess they're not so difficult, but they can read them flatly or they can discover what kind of space is in them. And, and with the current paintings, they can walk around and have their own experience. And um, the line work paintings were difficult because there was different ways of interpreting the language of the diagram. Hmm. Okay, I, um, I have a question for you that I've um, been asking a lot of artists. Um, uh, which is just how how are you adjusting life to quarantine, if, if at all? I think people are interested in, hear, in hearing from artists on this point because um, suddenly lots of people are presented with the prospect of working alone, um, with a lot of unstructured time, um, and that might be that might relate in some way to how we imagine artists are are living day by day. Um, so what is your experience of um, this extraordinary pandemic, social isolation, quarantine been? Has it changed the way you operate or? Yeah, very much so. I think during Hurricane Sandy, I freaked out. I tried to get to the studio as best I could. I was an anxious mess, but I feel so happy to be at home this time. I feel sad for all the people who don't have the luxury I have uh, who are out working or who don't have health care. Um, I heard somebody say it's, it's the black plague with no pun in that, you know, there are racial divides. Um, so I feel a great sense of gratitude and peace. And I also feel really aware of all the suffering, but in terms of my home experience, it has so much to do with what I think is happening in the world at large in that I see that a lot of us are purging. Unfortunately, there's, you know, the Strand isn't taking books and thrift stores are closed, but I'm going through my closet and I'm going through my bookcase and I'm going through everything and I'm my photos and I'm trying to find what is essential in my life. And from a personal point of view, since I'm stuck with myself and I don't have my coping mechanism, which is going to the studio every day, um, I'm in a, a, a particularly self-evaluative um, mode, which is quite fruitful and oftentimes kind of painful, but I think it's terrific. And I'm gonna get out of this as a lot of us are like in a much stronger place. Um, but as far as the paintings are concerned, I think if there's any show that deserves to have an empty gallery with nobody in it, this is it. I'm just so happy that they're 
hanging out alone. They're, they're good paintings to be hanging out alone in, um, <laughs> in a room. I feel good about that. And I feel grateful to the gallery um, for having them up. And, but as far as um, the art yeah, world is- Do the paintings have personalities like that, 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 where they would appreciate being alone or together? <laughs> I don't know. I'm freaked that way. Um, they're just good there. You know, it's a good place for them. I, I just feel really at peace about it. I hope people see the show. I certainly do. Do you know, do you know what the current plans are for reopening or keeping the show open through the spring? Well, we all, we're all in the dark about everything. And I think the gallery is intending to keep it up um, into May. And I think that Truly, their intention is to have people, people's bodies in that space. And th they'll see if they can, but I think that's their intention. And um, for which I'd be really grateful. We could have a second opening and let people in 10 people at a time. Um, but I think the funny thing about this time is that we're going to reevaluate what it is to accumulate objects. So that you know, after, after we're really left alone with a sense of um, arrest. We're buying a lot of wine and groceries. <laughs> it's funny because the prints that I made are the only thing that's selling in this pandemic because they're not highly priced and they're extremely, extremely colorful and beautiful and quite life affirming. So there's always, um, I, I think this online stuff has really been wonderful. I, I watched the Cecily Brown talk the other day um, and she walked us around her studio, but um, I had a teacher who told me that business is the, um, business is the selling of good ideas. So I think now is a time for us to sort of take stock of good ideas. I don't mean to sound Pollyanna, but that's always been something I've held to in the studio. It wasn't a painting teacher. Um, but I feel like if, if paintings are communicative, then, then they will have relevance. I'm hoping that these paintings have a sense of timelessness. And I think that term timelessness is so up for grabs that I'm hesitant to even use it. We have some questions and actually one that is related to quarantine. Robert is asking if you're using the time to explore or an experiment. I was making paper mache. I'm cooking a lot. Uh, I rooted some philodendrons and I planted them. I think, I think I can't think of anything else. Oh, I, I know this great thing to do during a pandemic, which is to wear all the things in the in your closet that you kind of like, but you'll never wear and nobody's going to see it. So I'm wearing goofy outfits at home. And Will has a beard. Yeah, I'm growing a quarantine beard. Yeah, it's, like David Letterman. Yeah. Most people are making art. I'm certainly not making art. Greg Gregory Lindquist. Um, thanks for listening, Greg. He's oh, hi, Greg. He, he asks, um, how much does the environment um, and reflection determine the installation of the paintings in your show? So in terms of installing the show, I guess, um, uh, that, what was your process there? Here, and let me, I can pull up some more of those screenshots. Yeah, that, that bolt that painting that I keep out. referring to, um, which is really like an, an homage to Bryce Martin's Grove series. Um, that's the only one that really uh, we actively placed in the gallery so that it would link the big room to the small room. But in terms of um, the placement, I think there's a lot of accident at play. And my friend Chris Apgar bought a huge red painting of mine, put it on his wall and then said, Kate, I can't even see it. And he was about to get one of those lights that you'd put over like a, a dog painting and we laughed and I said, you know, you just have to let this painting be seen when it wants to be seen. So there's always problems and it either doesn't come to life as much as it should or it comes to life too much.
Uh, Christopher Howard is asking um, how many layers of paint are typically applied to a single painting? And also what kind of paint do you use? I use naughty paint and I hope nobody else uses it, although I know that um, Gary Hume uses it. It's really toxic. I use enamel paint from, from uh, Europe. It's called Fine Paints of Europe. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it, but if it's a red painting, I put six layers. If it's not a red painting, then I put um, at least four, but most of these paintings are figured out over time. So like, for example, the painting that I started in 2008, there are countless layers. Like Luther will tell you, he's so tired of me wiping paintings away. And there are countless layers. The surveillance painting, as you can see, I just needed to make it. I knew what it looked like, so that I just made. That was like a cheater painting. Kate, is there anything else you wanted to say about your work that we didn't cover? Did you show the selfie painting? That's a cool painting. I don't know if I did. Um, oh wait, we, we have an anon a question from an anonymous attendee, which is very mysterious, um, which is, will Kate return to her line works? Yeah, I can't wait. Oh, that's gonna be so exciting. I didn't figure out like a new avenue for them, but um, I have all those brushes. That'll be fun. This painting is kind of prescient in that, um, if that's the way you say that word, in that you can see it's a painting with a painting inside of it, like a panel inside of it. And it's, it shows that it's kind of falling apart. So for me, I think it was, um, I was attracted to, to a sense of chaos at that moment, but a, a, a gorgeous chaos. So this was two shows ago. It was called Debris. Um, but I'd love for you to show more of the printed paintings because that's really the genesis of the show. This one? Yeah, that was yeah. like one of the very first paintings. So I put that painting on the wall and I took a picture of it with my cell phone. And you can see my windows and they hit the joint of the painting where the painting joins. I didn't like that I was in the painting, but after a while I thought it was just a hint of a person and it was um, little enough so that it didn't dominate the painting. But so I called it selfie so for the obvious work. reasons. What? So th this is printed, right? This isn't, um, I mean, I, I, now that we're looking at this more closely, I can see it, it could be confusing for people on the screen. Um, yeah. Because, because this isn't a reflection captured by the photograph of the painting. This is in the painting, right? Right, this is yeah. the painting. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like this whole show just falls in, it folds on to itself. That's what I wanted to do. Um, we have a, a question from uh, Susan Harris. She's asking, Hi. Um, she wants to pursue the conversation about abstraction and representation. What do your paintings say about your identity and or what could you say about the stories they tell? Man, that's a big one. You'd have to come big. to therapy with me. <laughs> uh, identity, I'm like a really happy dark person. And, um, and I'm trying to find, unlike you know, I was reading a wonderful review in art form about Rachel Harrison, and I think a lot of artists are embracing chaos and disparity and things falling apart and things that are unlike each other. I'm doing the reverse, and I think it's because it's what I need deeply um, emotionally and spiritually. I, I, uh, I think we all go to our studios to fulfill a different element of ourselves or to express a different element of ourselves. And this is, this is like my refuge. My, this fight is my refuge. So I don't want it to, I don't want it to be overly like jagged. I don't know if that, is, Susan, does that answer your question? It's a big one, man. It's a big question. And actually, we have time, let's say, for one, one more question. Um, and this one is from Jeff Bergman. 
uh, and he says, "Hi, Kate. Um, what do you find uh, you What do you find that you want to keep in the one out of ten times you don't wipe away the screen printed image Luther lays down?" As far as the screen printed image, you know, it's like what I was saying earlier that I want, I want, I want there to be space. I want it to be ambiguous. I want it to be legible, but ambiguous. And um, if I have another opportunity to show the reflection paintings that I, I already have the work and it's, it's more so-called difficult. Um, but I forgot the question. I think that there's, this, there's an element of clarity. Plus Luther and I had a, a lot of trial and error about um, technical issues about how to get the values correct and wooden panels were uneven, et cetera. So I had to use different panels. So um, it's about um, values, value shift. Like, you know, like in an old master painting, not to sound too um, whatever, but like there should be like a one, two and three in an old master painting. And uh, I try to sort of balance the value uh, the overall value structure of a painting. That's a really nice answer, Kate. And, and I think that's a great question to end on. Um, I, I want to thank you for taking the time to do this. It's been um, such an inspiring conversation uh, to hear from you about um, your work in the show. And I sincerely hope that everyone who participated, it looked like there were uh, more than 80 people at a, at a certain point in the discussion. Um, I hope they all get a chance to see the show um, because um, it's something to look forward to on the other side of this. <laughs> Thank you so much, Will. It's such a pleasure to talk to you. And I, I also really hope that people see the show. Thank you so much. <laughs>